God has a plan for this church. He has a plan for you. You know, it's exciting to see how much we've got going on here on a Sunday morning. That means God is doing something here, amen? You know, turn with me, if you would, this morning to uh, Acts chapter 17. And I want to talk to you this, this morning about the subject of what I would call intentional Christianity. This is one of these messages that God laid on my heart about two months ago. And I just kind of had it on the back burner in my mind. And I kept just telling the Lord, when you feel like the time is right, that's when I'm going to go after this. So <laughs> Acts chapter 17, we're going to read verses 1 through 9. It says, when they had passed through uh, Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom, as his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming unto you is the Christ, he said, and some of the Jews were persuaded and joined, and Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women, but the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace and formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond, and they let them go. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we sit here this morning, God. Lord, we want to be an intentional believer, Lord. We don't want to be somebody that just kind of floats through this Christian experience, Lord, just haphazardly, Lord, getting there or maybe getting there. God, we want to totally get there. And so, God, we pray, God, this morning that there would be a revival in our hearts, God, of what it is to be intentional about what you have called us to do. And, Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. You know, I want to go back to verse 2. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue on three Sabbath days, meaning three Sundays in a row, and reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. You know, what you see here is the best example that I could give you of what I call intentional Christianity, meaning that you don't wait for the action to come to you, you go after it. You know, I had the experience this year of watching my youngest son take up tackle football for the very first time. And I told him the same thing that the coaches told him, uh, you're doing an okay job, but you need to quit waiting for the ball to come to you and you need to go after it. Okay, you're doing an okay job there, little buddy, but you need to be a little more intentional about playing this game. When you read Acts chapter 17, Paul was not waiting for the ball to come to him. He was going after it. You know, I've got a guy sitting back there in the back row this morning that kind of got me into deer hunting a year or so ago, Jim Bucker. You don't really go after the deer in deer hunting. You sit and kind of wait for them to come by and hope you get a shot. That's okay with deer hunting, but it doesn't really, you don't stay on the team very long if that's how you play football. And in this whole thing of Christianity, just sitting there, just waiting for an opportune moment to come by, hoping you might eventually somehow stumble across a decent shot, really isn't the way that God wants our Christian life to be played out. Paul went into the synagogue on three Sundays in a row, sat down and said, gentlemen, can I tell you my story? And the fact that he kept going back three Sundays is in a row, it says, as was his custom, means that he did this everywhere he went. This was part of his spiritual DNA. When Paul showed up at a local town, he didn't just say, well, I wonder where I can find a nice service on a Sunday morning, sit in the back row and go unnoticed. No, he walked in and actively engaged in the process of what was going on and tried to change the culture. And he not only tried to change the culture, he entered into a dialogue, a theocratic dialogue with the religious leaders of that day and challenged them as to their thinking. And starting with the Word of God, he tried to prove to them, literally the Bible says prove to them, that this Jesus was the Christ. 
And you have to really think about it. Who would have been a better man for the job than this than Paul? Who he himself at one time was a, a religious Jewish zealot who was persecuting people, dragging Christians out of their home and killing them because he felt like they had muddled the grace of God and the law of God and they weren't supposed to do that? Who would have been a better man for the job than Paul to do this? You see, what Paul was doing right here in this moment of time is he was modeling intentional Christianity. That you don't just sit around and wait for the ball to come to you, you go after it. You know, we, uh, I'm sure you picked up this morning that we're getting ready to go to Bolivia here on a missions trip. And that's all fine and dandy. But you know, I guarantee you, you will never minister to hurting people in Bolivia waiting for them to come to you in the United States of America. If you wait the, for the ball to go to you, you're going to be waiting forever. You've got to go after the ball yourself. You know, uh, we all have these sovereign appointments in life where God just kind of orchestrates something in our lives and you find yourself in the middle of a great ministry opportunity. And those are the fun ones, the ones that just God orchestrates. You don't even really know you're looking for something until you walk to the door and, ah, there it is. You know, I've told you this before. I'm one of these guys that actually enjoys shopping a little bit, but do you know how I shop? People ask me, what are you looking for? I have no idea what I'm looking for, but when I see it, I'll know it. Huh? And you see, that's kind of the way, and sometimes God will open up these doors and you walk through a certain door and you didn't even know that's what you were looking for until it's looking you in the face and aha. Let me ask you just a question here. What do you do with any amount of consistency in your life that would indicate that you are an intentional Christian? You know, I uh, I actually, I missed last week, first week in a long time, but you know, I go to the... uh, county jail every week for more than one reason. And I go to the state prison for more than one reason. It's called living intentionally as a believer. And I understand that sometimes as a pastor I have opportunities that not everybody has. But let me ask you again, what do you do in some way, in a scheduled way, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis, a missions trip, that if I had to prove that you were an intentional Christian, that there would be enough evidence to convict you as being guilty. Paul went into the synagogue three Sundays in a row, sat down with the same group of men. And you know, the reason he came back the second two Sundays is I'm sure after the first Sunday, he realized, hey, wait a minute, this conversation isn't over, is it? This is a conversation that needs to be finished. Hey, guess what? I'll be back next Sunday, next time, next place. The same time, same place. I'll see you again next Sunday. Point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, intentional Christianity is looking for opportunities to share your faith. You know, uh, I was telling, I talked about a little bit this Wednesday night. Um, You know, I I get stuff all the time just sent to me because I'm a pastor. And uh, I got this thing recently. You've all heard of this book uh, called Through the Gates of Splendor. It's about these uh, five young men that graduated from Wheaton College. And in the year 1956, they all went to Ecuador. And there was a movie made about them a couple of years ago called The Tip of the Spear, correct? Do you remember this? And I was sent uh, kind of an interesting twist on this. And what it is, it's, it's one of the sons of one of the missionaries that went down in Ecuador. And uh, this guy is about my age, by the way. He looks like he's about 51 years of age, give or take. And, uh... But he began to talk about his dad dying there in the jungle. And uh, one of the comments that he made... He said, now, I know for a fact I'm going to offend some people here. But he said, I really believe that God orchestrated my dad's death to spark a revival in these Indian tribes. You know what's going on in these Indian tribes? They were just killing each other right and left. And it was pretty much over territory. Here's what's interesting to me, too. You know, you, uh, you watch the news, and they, uh, they show all the violence that's going on in the inner cities. And you've seen this where in one big inner city, there's 20 or 30 shootouts and one weekend, and they say, oh, the problem is guns. Well, you know, the same thing was happening in Ecuador in 1956, only they were doing it with spears. Now, what is really the problem there? Is it the gun? Is it the spear? Or is it the condition of the human heart? Hello? Now, you can take a guy's gun away and still not fix his heart, and you can take a guy's spear away and still not fix his heart. But you can only fix a man's heart through imposing the God equation into his heart, right? Right? And that's what they went there to do. So they show up there, and they thought everything was going pretty good for a while. All of a sudden, they still don't know exactly what it was that sent these men off, that tipped these men off the way that they did. 
But they got out of this airplane one day and they were all attacked and they showed some of the videos and some of the pictures of these men laying in the river. And it was, it, they were just really flashes because they didn't want you to really look at it because it was really kind of, you could tell the piranhas had gotten to these guys. But you know what the end of the story was? One of these widows took the man that had put his spirit into her own husband and brought him down to the river in the exact same spot where he had, where he had killed this woman's husband and she baptized him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now that's intentional Christianity, eh? Could you do that? Could you take the guy to put a spear in your husband, a bullet in your husband, and take him right down to the exact same spot and baptize him? Intentional Christianity is looking for opportunities that share, where you share your faith. And sometimes they're not pretty beautiful opportunities. Number two, number two, intentional Christianity is not being ashamed to pray for someone. You know, uh, this is something, you know, you know, everybody has their gifts and everybody has their real fiery passions in life. And I have to admit that, you know, really grabbing somebody and pulling them out of a line and really praying for them is not exactly what God's wired me up to do. But, you know, uh, one of the things that God has dealt with me on is, am I ashamed to pray for someone, especially in public? Now, let me give you two extremes here. There's a right and a wrong way to do everything. Have you ever seen an evangelist that calls a young man up in front of everybody and he's got a microphone on like this and the kid's kind of whispering in the guy's ear and the guy grabs him and says, in Jesus' name, I pray that the demon of... And he broadcasts the kid's sin to the whole world. The kid, the kid doesn't fall over under the power of God. He falls over under embarrassment. You ever seen that happen in the church? That's disgusting. One of the things that I do, I try to do, when someone comes to me, is I try to get them from a public to a private setting. So if this person wants to vent, they can vent. If they want to cry, they can cry. If they want to rejoice, they can rejoice, whatever it is they want to do. But I've learned to try to say to somebody, you know, if they're standing there kind of, kind of pouring their heart out to me, can I pray for you right now? Now understand, if someone says yes, and you're sitting in McDonald's, I wouldn't broadcast, oh God, I pray that her husband that's involved in an affair right now, okay, you don't do that. But in the, in, in the way that you know that the Holy Spirit would want you to do that, take that moment right then and right there and just pray for that person. And you don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to make a show out of it. One of the signs of a Pharisee in Matthew chapter 23 is they make lengthy prayers in public for show. God is not impressed by how good you can pray in front of everybody or how long you can pray. Okay? He's impressed with, with a sincere heart. And the next time you have someone who begins to t dialogue with you and they begin to pour their heart out to you and you can see this person is really struggling, why don't you, why don't me, why don't we all step out in faith and say, let's pray about that right now. And it's okay to step behind a tree. It's okay to step behind a wall. It's okay to step, you know what I'm saying? It's okay to kind of get, you know, you know we was going over this a couple of Sunday, uh, Wednesday nights ago. We're going through the book of Mark on Wednesday night and uh, it's a long story, but in Mark chapter 8, you remember with Jesus and the story of the blind man. And what did he do? He took the man by the hand, he led him out to the edge of the city, and he prayed for him out there. He got him out of the chaos. And I've never found it be, to be very effective to pray for someone, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, like when it's, you know, it's like, oh, well, where, where's Waldo? You know, like that kind of a thing. I've never had a lot of trouble, a lot of luck praying for somebody in the middle of a crowd like that. But if you can reposition the moment, say, look, I want to pray for you right now. Let's just let's go over here and let's just kind of get a little moment of silence here. You know what that is? That's called being an intentional Christian. Number three. An intentional Christian, being living intentionally, is looking for opportunities to make other people feel accepted and wanted. You know, uh, when we get together, whether it's on a Sunday morning for a worship service like this, or whether it's a church picnic, or whether it is a really good movie at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I, I want to just, this is one of these sermons I probably should have preached about four years ago. I shouldn't have waited this long, but I want to just challenge us all this morning. 
or something. And, and I want, if you get nothing else out of this message, I want you to take this with you, okay? When you walk on a Sunday morning, I want you to start to think a little differently. And instead of looking for that face that you know, I want you to look for that face that you don't know. And I want you to make an effort to intentionally go out of your way to walk up to that person and say, hey, I know I've seen you here before. I've never really caught your name. My name is Dan, and your name is. Now, again, let me say, you know, we've got a great church here, I, a bunch of great people. But I'm always amazed, uh, even like I'll be talking to a guy that sits on this side of the church, and I'll ask him, do you know that guy that sits on this side of the church? Man, I probably know the face, but I don't know the name. And I'm not saying this is a sin. What I'm saying is that if you want to be all that God wants you to be, if you want to be a guy like Paul who walked in and actively engaged the local congregation, you need to start living your life a little more intentionally. Now, let me just throw this at you. Understand, as the pastor of this church, that's kind of my job. You know, it's kind of my job to, quote, work the crowd a little bit and kind of get to know everybody. People expect that out of me. Okay, I don't really feel like I'm going above and beyond. I don't feel like this is the extra mile for me to do this. But I do believe that this is what God wants you to do. Now, let me throw some things in the, in the, in the, in the, in the mix here, okay? I understand what it's like to get dialed in to your own little group in the church. Okay, I understand what it's like to get dialed in to your own little group of friends or your family, okay? But do you understand that Jesus did not die for your little clique. He died to save you of your selfishness. Do you understand that? Okay. Now, I, I want to address something here. Um, how do I say this? I understand that not everyone you meet in a church on a Sunday morning are necessarily as approachable as the next guy. You know Mr. and Mrs. Glasswall? You know who Mr. and Mrs. Glasswall are? Okay. And I understand that not everybody you meet in church on a Sunday morning is necessarily going to have something in common with you. Okay, I could name you a half a dozen people off the top of my head this morning that I don't have a lot in common with. That still does not give me the right to pull up my nose and to walk by that person and act like they're not even there. Now, uh, I'm getting in deep, ain't I? You're all, you're all wondering how I'm going to get out of this, aren't you? Uh, you know, yeah. Here's the thing, too. I know what it's like to, to have certain people that you obviously do connect with, okay? And when you come to church on a Sunday morning, it's very easy for this to become more of like a 15-year class reunion where you sit around and talk to your old best friend all Sunday morning, and why should I reach out to that person sitting over there? Because I didn't like him all through high school, so why would I like him now? You see? Let me just tell you what happened at one of my 30-year class reunions. I had a, an old friend. I, I, would say an old, old, I wouldn't say an old friend. I'd say an old acquaintance. I, I'm getting hot on this sermon. Can you believe that? <laughs> and uh, I, I had a, an old acquaintance. And I know for a fact that when I, I walked up and I saw him and he saw me, and I was actually talking to someone else, and uh, I know he thought I was probably just going to snub him off. And I, when I got done talking to this other person, I spun around and I walked my wife over there and I introduced her to the guy and I introduced our, our, why, why we knew each other and our relationship and, and uh, whatnot. And the next thing you know, the guy's my best friend on Facebook and old buddy Dan and this and that and the other thing and on and on and on and on. And I think all he was waiting for was for me to open the door to invite him in. Now, again, I want just to, to really challenge your thinking this morning that I understand that you have a few certain people in this church that you're probably the most connected with. You're, you, you have family here that you feel connected with, and that's okay, okay? But it's not okay to stay there forever, okay? Now, here's the other thing, too. You say, well, I'm a newcomer, and uh, this person's been here a long time. Aren't they supposed to come up to me? Well, you know, Paul was a newcomer when he walked into the church in Thessalonica. And he walked in and engaged the religious leaders that were there. I'm sure there was a couple of priests there and, and uh, some teachers of the law and some Pharisees and some Sadducees. And he walked in and sat down and said, hi, my name is Paul. 
You know, there's a, verb, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says if a man desires friends, he is to show himself, what, friendly. And I think you will find that the average person in a church on a Sunday morning does not have too many friends. And if they do, you don't need them as a friend anyway, so move on. But I want us to all begin to think a little differently here on a Sunday morning, and I want us to all start to think a little bit more intentionally about who could I walk up to this morning and say, hi, my name is... You know, um, I got a... stumbled across an article recently. Hey, Nick, can you find uh, me a picture of that Jennifer LeClaire? Can you show me a picture? It's, uh, it's on there. Just... Uh, this lady, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you just a small portion of an article that I, I'm on this lady's news feed. I, I like her. She's a, an author. She's the, actually the news editor at Charisma Magazine. And let me, before I even give you any part of this, um, 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 article here, let me just give you her credentials. Uh, she's a nationally and internationally known kind of prophetic minister in charismatic circles. So this lady is well-known in charismatic circles. But I want to read you just a small portion of one of her articles here. She says, I just couldn't fit in. I love the worship. The messages were Christ-centered. The congregation was growing, and I served on a team. I joined the Bible school. I went to prayer meetings, but try as I might, I just couldn't fit in. I wasn't the only one. It was a common <clears throat> for all new members. We were welcomed originally with open arms, but then we were kept at arm's length. The group that had helped launch the church was a near impenetrable bunch of passionate believers and were very selective about who they let into their inner circle. This church clique even had its own buzzword, buzzwords. Everything was intense. They were always stoked. Many things were profound, and they did everything in the grace of God. But if you came from another church, your speech gave you away, and you were shut out of the inner clique. It was frustrating, and I had never experienced it before. I had always been part of kind of the inner circle and knew the language, but I just couldn't fit in. I eventually left that place and found a place that did welcome me with open arms and a place that embraced me. Since then, I've visited several churches of many sizes and denominations and found out that church cliques are usually always present everywhere. Then she cites a uh, study done by Balswick and Lane where they identify four different types of cliques in a church. Now, I'm going to give you these here real quick. Yeah, that, that's her, yeah. Number one, she says there's the married cluster couples. That's obvious. You know, married people kind of hang out together. And then there's the Christian educator cluster. Uh, she says these are the people that typically make the decisions on what is taught in a church theologically. You know, this is what we believe. Then there's the established member cluster, what we would call the longstanding, you know, uh, founding father members of the church, uh, sometimes just the old people. And then there's the prominent member cluster, which is people that have money and influence. Now, what she goes on to say, she says, I don't disagree with that little study, but she says, she goes on to say, have you ever seen a worship team that's a clique? Right? Do you understand that anything in a church can become a clique if you allow it to? Now, let me throw this at you. And I say this a bit tongue-in-cheek. Is the board in this church a clique? No, it isn't. It could be, but it's not. First of all, a board is biblically ordained by God in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It could become a clique if I wanted it to be a clique and if I nurture that and cultivated that within the DNA of the group, but it's not a clique because we don't allow it to be. Is the pastoral staff in this church a clique? Could be. I've been in churches that that's the way it was. It's a total clique. I hope and I pray it's not here. And if it is, I'd like to know where, and I will address it. You know, me and my wife talked about this this week. I sent her this article. She said, you're really going to talk about this on a Sunday morning? I said, I guess. <laughs> you know? And I, we were sitting there last night talking about this. And I said, let me ask you a straightforward question. Am I a click? Am I a click? You know, if you're really going to be honest and if you're really going to work through some of these issues as a church, you have to ask those questions, don't you? Is the pastor a click? Is the staff a click? Is the board a click? Is the worship team a click? Well, I would like to think not, and if it is, I'd like to know where and I will address it. 
But here's my point. Understandably, people always kind of mold together with common likes and common interests. But here's where I really want you to go with this. Here's what I really want you to get out of this this morning. Let's go back to walking up to someone and saying hello. Okay, I, you know, uh, I would encourage you that a lot of times this works better within uh, the context of age. You know, the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings, and the 40-somethings. Let me give you an example. I, uh, I see people that come here on a Sunday morning, and they uh, kind of come in alone. A lot of times they sit alone, leave alone. And then I go to the Mexican restaurant or wherever, and I see the same group of people sitting together. And why don't you just try to find that one person that seems to be all by themselves and say, hey, we're going to go over to the Mexican restaurant. Why don't you come with us? And why don't you make the effort, since you're one of the people that's in the group, why don't you make the effort to bridge that gap and drag somebody along with you? Do you know what this is, folks? This is intentional Christianity. I had a guy in my last church that would come up to me on a Sunday morning. He didn't come very often, but when he did, he would come up and he would grab me and he'd say, Pastor, inspire me this morning. Pastor, set me on fire. And I'd say, I'll do my best, brother. And usually at the end of the service, he'd come up and give me a big hug and say, that was so great, Pastor. And I'd say, thank you. And not one time would he ever come in on a Sunday morning and say, Pastor, what, who can I reach out to here this morning that's hurting and lonely? Let me tell you a true story. You know who a guy by the name of Andre the Giant is? He's dead now. You know what that guy used to do? He would go to the local bar, and he would find the loneliest person in that bar, and he would sit and spend the night with that person. I don't know if he even knew the Lord. I think he knew the Lord better than some of us did. See, I want us to start to think a little more intentionally here on a Sunday morning. And here's the thing you have to understand, too. No church has a program for every possible case scenario, okay? Since Cameron has started here, you know, we have a, you know, we obviously have a youth group and we've tried to start this uh, uh, for young, uh, not just for young uh, singles, but just for young people. Even if you're married and you've got small kids, uh, you, you, if you can find a center, you can come to this group, okay? But we've tried to start ministries, okay, to, 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 to kind of focus at and, and to try to, you know, everybody we possibly can, but being a church of this size, obviously we can't have a ministry to everything and everybody. But if there's not a ministry for you that you don't feel like is connecting with you, then approach someone in the church, approach me or Pastor Cameron or someone on the board and say, what can I do to serve? You know, going back to this buddy that of mine that come up to me on Sunday morning and said, Pastor, fire me up this morning and fire, fire me, Pastor, set me on fire. I always wanted to say to him, brother, if you find somebody here this morning that's really hurting to reach out to, I guarantee you the fire that you're looking for inside of your heart, it'll be there. You will find what you're looking for in serving, not in receiving. In the words of our Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, uh, I had a real uh, blessed moment one time where uh, I was able to sit and listen to a guy named Rick Warren. And uh, he spoke, came in and spoke to a, a group of pastors there at General Council. You just had to uh, buy a ticket to get into this uh, lunch. And you had a little lunch, and then he got up and spoke to us. And now, interestingly enough, he said... Uh, I want to talk to you today about the subject of personal soul, win, uh, soul winning. Now, he's talking to a group of pastors here, okay, Pentecostal preachers, and he says, I want to give you a little spiel here on soul winning. Now, you would think that a bunch of pastors feel totally secure in doing this, and some do and some don't. But uh, this whole idea of living intentionally, I, I want to give you his thoughts on how to talk to somebody about God. Let me ask you this. Does anybody here find it intimidating to, find, to talk to somebody about God? You find that intimidating? Okay, well, I'm going to hope to help me make it unintimidating for you here in about five minutes. When Rick Warren sits down to somebody, and this person doesn't really know who God is, here's the five questions he asks them. Number one, tell me your story. Now, he says everybody has a story. Most people are willing to tell their story if they know for a fact that you will listen and not judge them. But I think the fear of being judged is the main reason that people are afraid to tell their story. And going back to what I told you before, it's your job to create a safe atmosphere 
for this person to tell their story in. So the next time you have somebody sitting across the table from you and this person doesn't really know God, tell me your story. How'd you end up here? Number two, what's your passion? You know everybody has a passion? You know, if you were to ask everybody in this room privately, they might not want to say this publicly, but if you said, if there's one thing in the world you could fix, what is it? That's your passion. And everybody has one. They may not want to talk about it publicly. I don't know. But if you can get somebody to answer that question, what's your passion? That's what their real calling is in life. That's what God has burdened them with. The third thing is encourage them, encourage them and say to them, I can see you doing that. You know, sometimes all it takes is for somebody to come into their life and say, brother, I can see you doing that. I can see you starting that ministry. I can see you going on that mission trip. I can see you pastoring that church. I can see you speaking at that conference. I can see you serving in that capacity. And all of a sudden, oh, I can do this. So these are number four. <clears throat> Assist them. What could I do? What resources could I bring into your life to make that happen? You want to get a friend for life? That's how to do it right there. When you resource someone that helps them fulfill their passion in life, what's the one thing in the world you'd like to fix? I'd like to fix this. Okay, what resources do you need? Bang, you've got a friend for life right there. And number five <clears throat> is be a connector. If, if this person says, I want to be this, and you know someone that is this, you say, hey, do I got a guy to introduce you to? Some young kid comes up to me and says, boy, I would love to be a youth pastor. Hey, do I got a good guy to introduce you to right here? See, be a connector. How can you connect this person with what their passion is, what their calling is, and where they want to end up in life? You know what Brother Warren was trying to tell us to do there? He was trying to explain to us, live intentionally as a believer. And when someone's sitting across from you, sharing your faith with them and drawing out of them what's in them is not rocket science. It's a few simple questions. It's tell me your story. What's your passion? Encourage, assist, be a connector. Speaking of everybody who's got a story, Paul, you ready to go? Come up here, brother. You got that, wait, wait, Cameron, you got that mic. This is a young man named Paul. Paul has a special place in my heart because he's a tree trimmer. Amen. <laughs> but uh, he just recently started coming to our church, and he sent me a little note on Facebook and said, I just want to tell you why I'm coming back to your church again. And I got so excited about it. I said, Paul, could you share that on a Sunday morning? And uh, why, don't you, why don't you just... Uh... I uh, It was very powerful for me to come and share this. I came to this church as a child, both me and my wife, and uh, this is a story of I, how I lost my way. Uh, in 1989, I joined the Marine Corps. I served over in the Gulf, and I had lost one of my best friends who died right in my arms, and I struggled with that for a while. I returned home. Um, and I lost a child to a genetic disorder. And I had trouble with that. And then shortly after that, one of my other friends, very good friends I had served with, who had lived through the war, made it home, was killed by a drunk driver, leaving a wife and a young child behind. And I could not, with all that, I had lost my faith. How could God let something like that happen. I ended up self-medicating myself with drugs and alcohol. Sending myself deeper cost me a marriage. And at the time, I thought it was myself. Through years, I'd gotten myself out of drugs and alcohol, on a better path. And I had remarried again. She was taken from me by a rare disease called amyloidosis. And I just still continue to keep my back turned to God. Then, being a stubborn man that I am, would not ask for any help after I lost my wife, Christine, and now my 
present wife, Susan, came in and took care of me and my son, knowing I would not ask for no help. And that blossomed into a beautiful relationship. We are now married and we have a beautiful daughter. Still, I had no realization of what was going on. And out of nowhere, the least likely person I would think of, my neighbor, David Terry, comes over and starts talking to me about this motorcycle ministry called Road Riders for Jesus. And he goes, I just, he goes, something's telling me I need to come and talk to you about this. And I said, okay. And he tells me a little about it. I let it go. He comes over another two or three days later. Hey, you know, I don't mean to bother you, but I really need to talk to you about this. God is telling me. I said, okay. And I got, I felt myself getting a little excited about that. And I go inside and I talk to my wife about it. And then for some reason, I don't know how to exactly put it into words. Re something reached inside of me, which I know was God. And put a fire in my soul turned on the light in my life to see everything that I had went through. I was being selfish. My wife had tried to push me to, let's go to church, let's go to church. And I wouldn't listen. But he put her there when I needed her most. He gave me a complete family. He gave me a beautiful daughter. And now I know that it was God that was with me to, to see me through those things put these beautiful things in my life through all these tragedies and now I have a, a hunger and thirst to bring closer to God now than I ever have in my life and I am extremely thankful to God my wife my neighbor because when I turned my back on God, he never turned his back on me. Thank you. Bless you, Paul. How tech service this morning is uh, I would just like to have just the, the men of the church especially just uh, file by, just come up here and meet Paul. I know some of you know who he is, some of you do not know who he is, and I just think this would be a very appropriate ending to this message this morning. I want you to be an intentional believer this morning. Come up here, introduce yourself to Paul, and let him know that he's got a whole bunch of friends rooting for him this morning. Amen? Amen. God bless.